Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Kevin Banks, the director of the Center for Law and the Contemporary Workplace here in Queens. I'm uh, delighted to introduce our Douglas Cunningham visiting lecturer, uh, Professor Kevin Colvin. He is an associate professor and uh, vice chair at the Rutgers Business School. Um, Kevin's a recognized expert on transnational labor regulation and labor governance in supply chains. He's, his work has appeared in a number of leading journals. Uh, I can attest to this because I regularly assign his work to students in my international labor law classes. Um, he also frequently presents around the world. He's presented at Harvard Law School, Stanford Law School, Tel Aviv University, and now, of course, here in Queens. Um, he's uh, regularly consulting with the International Labor Organization, uh, USAID, and he's currently serving a two-year appointment uh, to the Federal Advisory Committee for Labor Provisions of Trade Agreements, um, the U.S. Department of Labor, and this is a, I'm sure, a particularly interesting time to be serving in that capacity. Um, so, please make him feel welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much. I guess there's a thing about Kevin's working on trade and labor issues, um, but I'll just say, it's particularly interesting to work in that capacity because since the last administration was elected, we have not been convened. So that's uh, why it makes it particularly interesting as to what they're thinking about. But all right, but let's, uh, apart from that, thank you very much, um, Kevin, for inviting me here. It's, it's an honor to be here. And um, I'm looking forward to exploring the campus and town a little bit uh, this afternoon and have some time. Um, so I'd like to, um, take a little time and share with you today about some of the research and projects that I've been engaged in. As Kevin said, much of my work over the years is focused on questions of how we use various regulatory tools, including trade and, um, and, uh, and uh, trade law and trade agreements to improve working conditions in global supply chains. And I've been particularly interested in examining how non-state tools uh, can interact with state regulatory instruments to create dynamic regimes of enforcement in situations where state institutions do not necessarily meet the demands of global consumers and global so civil society or citizens. But I recognized that um, a critical factor, even a linchpin, in a number of the regimes that I was proposing in this work were consumers. Yet little of the regulatory or legal literature, um, or I for that matter, really had much to say about consumers. And one of the questions that I thought was particularly perplexing was that while there clearly were indications that consumers were increasingly interested and concerned about the conditions in which their goods were produced, it was odd to me that this concern um, existed despite the social and spatial distance between consumers and the purported objects of their concern, namely the global supply chain workers that relied on both consumers' concern and their desire to buy quality goods at low prices. So just to give you a, a little map, I know this sometimes can be helpful for the talk if it's a little bit longer, um, I want to do a little quick thought experiment, which we'll do in a second. Um, I'm then going to move and talk to you about changes in the global economy that have occurred that I call, and we've become what I call a supply chain economy. And then move to a little bit about the consumer reaction to those changes. Uh, and then get into a, a larger conceptual discussion of what I describe as cosmopolitan consumer citizenship, the notion of the consumer imaginary, and a corollary idea of, of social distance. Uh, and then, very briefly, discuss how we might harness the consumer imaginary in law and then, and then briefly conclude. So that's the, the general game plan here. Um, so the first thing I want to do is I'd like to ask, this is a little odd for a law talk, but I'd like to um, basically begin to ask you to think about the jacket that you put on today when you walked out the door. Now try and imagine the person or more like the people who sewed the zipper onto that jacket, who cut the fabric, who stitched it together, and who boxed and shipped it. Have you ever met these people? Have you ever met anyone who's actually worked in a garment factory 
either here in Canada or elsewhere. And if not, how do you imagine these people, are, or those, those people are more likely, those women, to be? Are they married? Are they mothers? What kind of homes do they sleep in? What does their workplace look like? What does it smell like? Now, also, think for a moment about the cup of coffee, or maybe tea that you drank this morning. Can you picture the landscape of the plantation on which the coffee bushes grew? In your mind, form an image of the faces and the hands of the people who picked the coffee beans that eventually made it into your mug. What do you think were the working conditions of those people whom you now have a mental image of? So if you played along in your mind, the mind's eye, with that exercise, you've just engaged um, what I term the consumer imaginary. And that is you created your, for yourself a narrative and the mental image of the producers and the origins of two distinct products, garments and coffee, that are staples of hundreds of millions of people. And perhaps, since my hope and expectation that you might have, in the course of doing this, triggered some degree of empathy for that person in your mind that you were imagining. Um, the thing, though, is that it's highly likely that you have never worked on a coffee farm. Anyone here work on a coffee farm? Anyone ever been to a coffee farm? There we go. Um, and it's highly unlikely that you've ever worked in a garment factory. And probably a number of us, I know some of us have, but most of us have probably never visited even a garment factory. Um, probably a little more likely we've done that than been on a coffee plantation. Nevertheless, it's quite possible that your consumption choices, especially those sitting in this room, are guided at least in part by the ways in which you imagine or are made to imagine the context in which the goods that you consume are produced and how you imagine the producers of those goods to be. In fact, if you do in fact make purchasing decisions based in some part on this criteria, you'd not be alone. A growing body of research suggests that consumers increasingly take into account the social and environmental context of the goods that they consume and make purchasing choices based on them. So many people are thus acting not just as consumers, but in fact as citizen consumers. And what I'd like to propose in my talk today is that the law should help catalyze citizen consumers to improve labor conditions and human rights compliance in the global supply chain by triggering the consumer imaginary. And I define the consumer imaginary to be how consumers in a global economy conceptualize and imagine the human beings, the processes, and the labor that produced the goods that they consume. So how consumers conceptualize and imagine the human beings, the processes, and the labor that produce the goods that they consume. And a little bit later, I'll actually suggest that this can be expanded out, that the consumer imaginary can also extend to how consumers conceptualize each other, other consumers, how they conceptualize companies, and all of it's um, imagined. OK, so um, the supply chain economy. So the first step to understanding the, tr the transition to consumer cit citizenship is uh, the changes that have occurred in the economy. The global economy has become what economist Richard Baldwin has described as having become unbundled. And the unbundling is a result of, one, reduced tariffs, two, reduced transportation costs, and three, in the second stage, the development of information and communication technology. So in the first unbundling, which has really been a fairly long and slow process, the cost of trade drastically declined um, through decreasing transportation costs and decreasing tariffs. And this has been occurring both in the developed and developing world. In the second unbundling, the information and commu communication technology revolution turbocharged this trend, leading to a rapid rise in um, global trade. And just so you can see, it's not that super relevant to the talk, but just so you get a sense, you can see, you know, starting in this graph, 1890 is from the Council on Foreign Relations. You can see there's obviously been a lot of ups and downs based on different, uh, this is in the US, of the different political circumstances, you know, leading to that huge spike, the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act. Um, but the overall trend, obviously, is down. And now the average 
uh, U.S. tariffs are really quite low. Um, they're even lower than 5%. Well, actually, I, I shouldn't say that because they've been spiked a lot um, in the last couple of years. So um, those overall averages will have gone up. But the, over, the overall trend is down. You can also see the same trends in uh, world tariff decreases. Canada's in there. It's basically a downward trend. Um, and I've seen numbers that even within the WTO, the average um, bound rates are really like something like three and a half to five percent or something. It, it's low. Um, at the same time, you see trades of goods and services has skyrocketed. There's been dips, but basically it's a one-way one um, route. So what this means, um, what, this, what this has also meant is that production has become increasingly outsourced, offshored, and spatially separated from consumption, and separated from the lead firms that had one time manufactured goods in-house. In other words, we've shifted from a vertically integrated and consolidated business model, which used to be in the old days when there wasn't so much trade, to a supply chain economy and supply chain business model. So you can see, you know, just to visualize, nothing. see, basically all our stuff coming over here is coming from different parts in the world. It can go back and forth. You know, a lot of intermediate goods, something might be shipped there, or get processed up here. Um, and so that's basically what we turn to. Um, and indeed, in some industries, businesses have basically become supply chain managers. I mean, I sit in a department of supply chain management at Rutgers, and they basically, my colleagues, basically define the supply chain to be just about everything a business does. So they seem to be starting to take ownership of what a business is. Um, you know, for example, so, but, okay. But in truth, companies really are um, increasingly supply chain operations. Boeing, for example, outsourced about 70% of the manufacturing and design for its latest 787 airplane, which um, basically turned the manufacture and design of this blockbuster new plane into a highly complex supply chain management project. And what does Nike make? What does Nike make? Nike, Nike makes nothing, right? That's, that's the joke, right? Nike makes actually nothing, and it hasn't for a very long time. Same thing with Apple, right? And that process, at first, Apple did have manufacturing facilities in the United States, and then Tim Cook actually came out of the supply chain and operations department. And by tw you know, 2010, almost everything was in China, and that had been a, a, a long march. Um, and it's now the most valuable company in the world. So these changes in the economy and in business processes have important implications for work, labor, and consumerism in the modern economy. And one result of the supply chain economy is what David Wilde describes as fissuring of the workplace. And one of the central fissures is that now the people that make our stuff are most often not direct employees of the companies from whom we buy that stuff. Whereas in the past, economies were more localized and there are more direct relationships um, between producers and consumers, now we rarely know the people that make the things, that make our things. The people who consume our things that we make and increasingly the internet of things, we rarely even meet the people who sell us those things. So in some sense, this has become a fairly dehumanized process of consumption versus the old days. A second significant issue has been what Gareffi and Mayer describe as governance deficits in the regulation of labor and global supply chains. And so without getting into too much detail, um, one significant deficit is that suppliers are located in countries and jurisdictions whose labor laws are either de jure or de facto weaker than those in the home country of the lead firm. And more importantly, those laws may substantially diverge from the normative expectations of civil society and consumers in the importing country. So what has happened in this, this move, this move to the supply chain economy, where consumption becomes less personalized, less, uh, where we have fewer engagements one-on-one -on -one with the people who make our stuff, who sell us our stuff? Well, one of the reactions has been that the consumer has struck back. So during this hard march uh, towards disaggregating production and having people make our stuff in countries in which labor standards don't meet wealthy country expectations, there has been a sort of Polanyian double movement where consumers have sought to re-embed markets in society, but this time through the market itself rather than necessarily through the state. 
And this consumer double movement has occurred in part because of exposés by transnational activists. Um, they're known, one of the lingo is transnational labor activist networks, or the human rights people refer to them as, and the media of poor uh, working conditions. Now, one of the first well-publicized instances of consumer citizenship in global supply chains, and I'll get to what I mean by consumer citizenship, but, but basically the citizen consumers um, taking actions in the market, um, occurred in 1996 when the television celebrity Kathy Lee Gifford, Gifford was accused by a labor rights group of licensing her name to a line of clothing, clothing marketed by Walmart um, and manufactured by a complicated network of suppliers, some of which were located in Honduras and that employed 13 and 14 year old children. In another important example, in 2006, the same labor rights group accused Disney, among others, of using suppliers in Jordan to manufacture apparel in Jordan that engaged in highly abusive labor practices, such as confiscating passports of the mostly foreign workers, forcing the workers to work unconscionably long hours, sometimes up to 72 hour shifts, if you can imagine, and sexual abuse. And one of the most recent examples is the Rana Plaza collapse um, in Dhaka in 2013, in which over 1,100 workers died and scores more were seriously injured. And the, the news media covered all of these stories very intensively. Some of you might be familiar with these, particularly uh, Rana Plaza. I think Lobla was involved with that, so it had a lot of publicity here as well. And in um, the Rana Plaza collapse, viewers and readers were confronted with really countless images of rubble and dead workers, arguably blurring the line between newsworthiness and exploitation. And that's, look at this, sorry. And that's where this photo comes in. This is a very famous photo that was splashed across a lot of newspapers. Um, and it's called The Embrace. Um, and this is one of the images. It's sort of a double-edged sword. On one hand, there's something expletive, ex, you know, exploitative about it, um, and but, on the other hand, it also spurred people to action. And um, you know, the, me the media clearly believe that news consumers, who are by and large also clothing consumers, would be deeply engaged in the tragedy. And after a series of online petitions intended to compel companies that were doing business in Bangladesh to take action, um, generated millions of signatures, many companies really believe this also. And this is an example of one of these online signatures, petitions, that took place, it was quite interesting. This, was for, uh, this wasn't actually the original one, this was a subsequent one focused on Benetton directly contributing money to a victim's compensation fund. This was in 2015. And you can see it got over a million signatures and Benetton, Benetton caved in. So just one of those technologies of activism, one of the technologies of consumer citizenship that are being used right now. Um, and following this tragedy, a small group of mostly US-based companies formed an initiative to address fire and safety issues in Bangladesh's garment factories, while a larger number of mostly European companies joined uh, to form a different organization. So there was two different organizations operating to try to address these issues in Bangladesh, both non-state entities. Um, and this incident and the others that I described above basically exemplify the important growing role of consumers in the regulation and governance of labor and the environment and other issues in global supply chains. Okay, so part three, cosmopolitan consumer citizenship. So the reaction of consumers and the threat of using their purchasing decisions to express political and moral preferences exemplifies, I believe, a new form of citizenship that we are seeing take shape in global so civil society and I call it cosmopolitan consumer citizenship. Now, while a few people in society actively engage, uh, well, while few people in society actively engage in traditional forms of politics in a sustained way, either at the local or national levels, nearly every one of us engages in acts of consumption almost every day. That means that consumption, which is generally practiced at the level of the market, is a potentially powerful means of expressing political and moral preferences. And consumption thus transforms in these instances from an activity solely aimed at satisfying one's immediate needs and desires to one that provides opportunities to express social and political preferences and to make an impact on the world. So in this sense, consumption can uh, become or be understood to be a site of political action. And when we engage in these small political acts um, through the market at the 
the global level with the intention in part of making social change and political impact across borders, this becomes a cosmopolitan act. And in the article in, in which this um, paper is based, which just came out a couple of months ago in the Vanderbilt um, Journal of Transnational Law, I engage more at length with some of the merits of market-based citizenship and um, some of the critiques and what it means at the cosmopolitan level. And we can discuss that more if you're interested uh, later. Um, but an important question to ask, and many people do, is to what degree do consumers actually care about social justice in the supply chain as opposed to just purchasing goods at the lowest cost possible? And that's a complicated empirical question. And more and more research is being conducted around it. Um, and I'm not going to claim that the majority of consumers are making purchase decisions based on social criteria over price and quality. However, there is a fair amount of research that demonstrates that within a reasonable margin that consumers will take action, or at least they wish to take action if they're properly nudged, or in this sense, properly um, catalyzed. So according to research, so I'll just give you a few examples. So um, according to research conducted by Richard Freeman and Kimberly Elliott, consumers reported on surveys that they are willing to pay marginally more for products that they are told are made in good conditions. Of course, like most things, this is price contingent. Those same consumers report a sharply decreasing willingness to purchase products that are made in good, good conditions as the price increases. On the other hand, when consumers are told that a t-shirt is made in bad conditions, they reported that they are far less willing to buy that t-shirt even if given a significant discount. So that makes sense? So basically, you're told, you're a consumer, you're told this is made in great conditions. You're like, okay, I'll pay a dollar more for that. Oh, but actually it's five dollars more for that. Eh, I'm not so sure. I'm gonna buy it. But if you are told this product is made in bad conditions, but I'm gonna give you a 20% discount. I'm just throwing these numbers out. The actual research has more precise data on that. But if I'm gonna give you a 20% discount, you're still like, nah, it's not worth it. So the outcome though, I mean, what we can take away from that is that companies are gonna be far more concerned, mo and for the average consumer, not niche consumers, about um, being uh, put in a negative light. They, they don't, they're gonna suffer much more from that than they're gonna benefit from being shown that they're fantastic uh, they have a fantastic supply chain compliance program. Other survey research has also found extensive support among consumers in the US and Europe for buying uh, products that are made in ethical and sweatshop free conditions. Remember, this is all survey, right? So Hertel and all had a paper in 2009 that showed that of, the, of those surveyed, about 65% um, would pay $5 or more for a sweater made in good conditions. A third were willing to pay $10 or more. And this was sort of like for an average consumer price. You can look, you look at the paper for the precise amounts. Over 75% were willing to pay 50 cents or more per pound for fair trade coffee, because they also looked at, they looked at garments and coffee. So for fair trade coffee, and more than 50% were willing um, to pay a, um, more than a dollar. Now, if you're like me who lives in Brooklyn and is a you know, bobo consumer, of high-end coffee, those percentages might change because we pay so much money for coffee. Um, so, you know, but this is just a, a general broad brushstroke. Uh, there's another uh, set of research, which I think is interesting, from, and this was a significant book by Stoll and Micheletti from 2013, based on a bunch of research they had done called Political Consumerism. And they drew on surveys in something called the European Social Survey, which is from 2003 in the Citizenship, Involvement, and Democracy Survey in the US, which surveyed self-reported political activity by consumers in the course of uh, their consumer activities. And according to these surveys, about 31% of people in, uh, either engaged in boycotting or boycotting, boycotting, or both. And in Sweden, about 60% of respondents reported doing so and the US, 28%. So you can see there's a high level of variability between countries, and when you get into the data from the book, you'll see there's a lot of variability based on gender and socioeconomic class. There's a, you know, there's, it's obviously a subtle story. But overall, the numbers are probably more than we might have anticipated if I handed out a piece of paper and asked you how many people do you think would report having engaged in any of these activities, 
in the last 10 years. Not people you know, but the average Canadian, the average American. Um, so that's all survey research. But a, a second strain of research attempts to uh, gauge actual consumer behavior through field and lab experiments. And this gets very interesting. So some field experiments do in fact suggest that consumers are willing to pay somewhat more for goods that they are told are made in better working conditions. In a study by Heinmuller and his Cox, I think it's a little hard to see those images there, but I'll tell you what that is. Um, uh, the authors compelled the US-based retailer The Gap, which owns one of the retail brands, Banana Republic, to allow an experiment in Banana Republic outlet stores. So basically, the researchers um, did a study in about 111 outlet stores in 38 states over a period of four weeks. And they put two different signs over um, three different goods. There is a, a women's suit on the right there. That was a $130 women's suit. Should have put the prices up there. There was a yoga pant in the middle there. That was, went for $18, so substantially less. And then there was a men's t-shirt on the left for $12. And one sign emphasized the fashion aspects of the product, right on the left, fantastic looking clothing, basically. I mean, it said something else, but I just put that in for short. Um, but stated nothing about the labor conditions. And the other sign on the right there, all it really said is that, that the, the products were made in, um, that the, uh, prom were made in good labor conditions and emphasized the company's commitment to promote fair and safe working conditions. Um, and it also stated that the consumers can feel good about what you wear. So there's a feel good language. And the researchers found that the signs that promoted good labor uh, conditions uh, in the production of women's suits, of expensive women's suits, significantly boosted sales of that item. But shoppers in the market for the lower cost items showed no statistically significant inclination to spend more on items made in good conditions. And the researchers concluded that their findings did confirm what many surveys suggest, that at least some segments of shoppers, and in this instance, women looking for higher priced items, are in fact willing to choose items, all things being equal, that are indicated to have high labor standards. But the authors made no claims to what exactly motivates those buyers. But regardless of motivations, it seems that such criteria are increasingly becoming part of the factors that lead to purchasing decisions. Now, we'll a little more on the experimental stuff. One of the most interesting experiments um, that I came across at least, albeit not in field conditions, but um, like lab experiment subjects, um, is reported by Piggers and Rockenbach. And like other researchers, the authors find that under experimental conditions, Consumers are indeed generally price sensitive, but when the right balance is reached between price and social responsibility, which their experiment, the authors uniquely define, uh, define to be wage levels of consumers, uh, consumers do take wage levels into consideration as a decision criterion. So they will make a, a purchasing decision if they know that wage levels are higher. But I think what was particularly interesting was the author's conclusion related to what they refer to as social distance and direct communication. And basically to summarize, the authors concluded that managers choose to pay higher wages to workers in competitive environments when there's actually direct communication between the workers, these are supposed to be the workers, um, and the consumer. And in the case of the study, what they did is they had consumers take a look at um, like these emoticons that were supposed to represent the happiness levels of the, the workers or their, wa of their wages. And when the consumer saw the happy faces that were purportedly directly communicated from the consumer, it wasn't just someone lapping it on there, and like the company, it was supposed to come from the workers themselves. This, um, in a statistically significant way, boosted the amount of money or, uh, that consumers are willing to pay in preference for the products. Um, so, uh, a last study I want to mention, which I just recently found, it's not even, it's just forthcoming in a, a business journal called Management Science, which is, you know, considered one of the very top journals, is by uh, someone named Ryan Buell at Harvard and uh, his co-author called Kanchi. And they did this incredible uh, experiment, which I still have to look more deeply in the, the paper that I literally just found before I was coming here and I was trying to brush up on some more things that were out there, where basically they um, looked at uh, 
clothing company and a coffee company, which we, we can get into more about it later. But basically, they found that if a company can demonstrate, can show transparency, transparency into its own internal operations, like basically how it's treating its own internal stakeholders like workers, that a consumer will be substantially affected and be compelled to buy that product, even more so if that company is saying, look how great we are, we gave a million dollars to the Rainforest Fund, like an external activity. Um, but when they show that they're doing good stuff internally, consumers are particularly compelled to purchase that product and, and pay more. So, um, so the discussion thus far has been fairly descriptive. So the economy has changed, which has led to changes in the fundamental structure of production um, and the geography of production and consumption. And as a result, we have seen to some extent a response by consumers and an interest in buying products that comport with their ethical criteria. So now I want to turn to a somewhat more conceptual and speculative discussion about what I describe as the social distance, remember Pigors and Rockenbach made reference to that, um, that has developed between producers and the consumers and how that's helped drive and form the consumer imaginary. So I like to claim that an important factor driving the consumer imaginary as it relates to labor and human rights issues is the increased social distance between consumers and producers that's been created by the supply chain economy. Now, for sociologists and social theorists, um, which Riggers and Rockenbach are not, but for sociologists and social theorists, the concept of social distance describes a degree to which people are willing and able to accept and include those who belong to other social groups based on race, social class, and nationality, to name just a few differentiators. And while social distance has been used most commonly to describe social relations between people who might have more relative geographic proximity, but that experience social distance from each other, so for example, um, people who maybe have been living in a community for 60 years in some white Midwest community, and then all of a sudden there's uh, migrant communities that move in with, with to take low paying jobs, there's going to be a great deal of social distance between those two groups, right? That's typically how sociologists would be thinking about this. But scholars are increasingly using the term to also describe social relations between various actors in the global economy who experience both social as well as physical distance. And we saw this in my earlier reference to Piggers and Rockenbach, as I said. So consumers are more geographically and socially distant from the social environmental realities of production now and from the workers who are involved in creating the goods. So like one thing that motivated I think the way I was thinking about this is a number of years ago I took this photo when I was doing a work for USAID in Bangladesh. This was a, a woman who was a shrimp worker and we went to visit the, their homes and talk to them about some of the conditions that were going on in the shrimp factories and I'm th sitting here thinking like all the Americans back home sitting in, there's a big seafood chain in the US called Red Lobster. Uh, you know, eating the shrimp that was produced in here, and they have no idea about the people on the other end of the supply chain, and it's part of what sparked off some of these questions. Um, and the, you know, the, the thing is that these processes and the consequences and the humanity of production basically becomes out of sight and out of mind. And to make the point more concretely, you know, the beautiful shiny Apple computer like I have over there seems as if it was just assembled out of the ether, and that's kind of the illusion that Apple wants us to, to think, right? Sort of descended from the, the sky. Um, as, you know, like, it just assembled itself by itself rather than by workers at Foxconn factory in China. And likewise, it's hard to understand that our crisp, you know, blue jeans that we picked off the shelves of a retail store were made in the middle of Jordan by migrant workers in, constant, in, in basically work camp-like conditions. And if production were local, if we knew the people who manufactured the stuff that we consume, and if those factories were actually located in our communities, we'd have a more visceral and Im immediate interest in ensuring that our neighbors and community members were treated fairly. But it's much harder to create that sense of connection and community in the model of production that we have. So the question then becomes is how to reduce that social distance that currently exists between consumers and producers. And I, I believe that the concept of the consumer imaginary can help in this task. 
So the idea of the consumer imaginary was influenced by, to, to me, by Benedict Anderson's well-known conception of the imagined community, if any of you are familiar with um, his work. Um, and it's also related to Charles Taylor's notion, um, which builds off Anderson of the social imaginary. So Anderson was using the concept in the context of political community in the modern nation state. And he basically argued that um, a nation, like the whole nature of a nation is essentially imagined as a community because regardless of the actual inequality and exploitation that exists in that political community, the nation is always conceived as a deep horizontal comradeship. And Taylor, who also was building on Anderson, described the social imaginary as the ways between, uh, the ways that people imagine their social existence, how they fit together with others, how things go on between them and their fellows, the expectations that are normally met and the deeper normative notions and images that underlie those expectations. And Taylor recognized that the narrative and that these images and the stories and the legends play important roles in the ways that people imagine their social surroundings. And this isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's just part of what constructs the way that we relate and connect in society. And Anderson wasn't necessarily saying it's a bad thing that we do that within a nation, just that noting that that is what cr creates the notion of a nation. It is imagined. We don't know people living out in Vancouver. OK, so I believe that Anderson's conceptualization also resonates with the nature of the market-based relationships between consumers and producers, between con consumers themselves, as well as between consumers and lead firms. So the, rule, the role that imagination plays in marketing and consumerism is well recognized. Marketing departments do a lot on that. Yet the imagined nature of the relationship between the consumer and the producer in global supply chains has not been discussed to my knowledge, but I think is rather apparent. And indeed, most consumers of t-shirts from Bangladesh and, consumer, and computers that are assembled in China will never travel to those countries and will never meet the workers who assembled them. Nor will most of those workers themselves likely make the journey downstream to the final destination of the fruit of their travails. And likewise, consumers who take individual, individual actions, such as boycotting, which, you know, are making alternative purchasing choices, or signing an online peti uh, petition are imagining their fellow global consumers as like-minded fellow travelers who share particular values and act on those values. And finally, managers of lead firms also imagine their customers to be citizen consumers, sometimes, who will, be, who will potentially take action in certain circumstances. And this, despite the potentially limited sco scope of such action and despite the lack of certainty that consumers may, in fact, so act. And aware of the power of consumers to pressure lead firms and the new dynamics of consumer citizenship, workers have actually taken creative steps to communicate with far-flung consumers about their working conditions. In one well-publicized case in, in my, at a Chinese um, labor camp that made Halloween toys sold at Kmart in the US and closed a written plea to the consumers of the product in hope of communicating with her about his plight. That's the latter. In another example, a woman who purchased a jacket at Walmart found a note in Chinese sewn into a jacket that described terrible working conditions in what might have been a prison labor camp or just an abusive factory that was prison-like, including 14-hour days and beatings. And this is the, the letter. She found it when she was purchasing. Um, so whereas once labor conditions and the grim reality of the workplace were hidden behind the veil of the commodity, New technologies have enabled workers and consumer movements to make the working conditions in factories and far-flung locales more transparent and seem even closer to home. Right? These workers are trying to close that bridge. They imagined the consumer that's about to buy their stuff and tried to form some form of direct communication. They needed that connection as much as the consumers maybe need a connection with the producers. And like in Anderson's account of the rise of political nationalism, New technologies of communication and changing apprehensions of time have facilitated these imagined bonds. Newspapers, videos, the internet, and social media have made it easier for consumers to imagine relationships and develop empathy for workers. 
What transnational activists do and what companies that utilize social marketing to pr promote their products do as well is to try and promote and forge these imagined relationships in order to realize their respective objectives. They do so by using compelling images of workers um, who consumers are told are either suffering or happy, depending on the objectives of the campaign. Indeed, the creation and wide diffusion of narratives and images is a central activity of transnational labor activist networks to basically reify for consumers the abstract concepts of, of supply chains and the people who work in them. While garment and apparel production is a trenchant example of this phenomenon, it's not the only industry in which imagined communities are exploited, and I don't necessarily mean that in a pejorative sense, um, to promote transnational campaigns or corporate marketing. So let's turn to one of the most commonly used means of harnessing the consumer imaginary by transnational activists, which are social labels. Most of us have probably seen some. Of all the forms of private market-based regulation, social labels are the most explicit in using the consumer imaginary. Social labels are usually part of certification regimes, often administered by some nonprofit third party. Uh, and the main goal is to provide ethically conscious consumers, and I'm quoting here from uh, one of those organizations, with credible assurances that goods are produced in a manner consistent with certain social and or ecological standards. And social labels can be directed both to end consumers, but they can also be directed to businesses that might want to ensure that the, good, the intermediate goods that they're buying, for example, are um, fair trade certified or comply with a certain set of standards. So um, social labeling is not a new phenomenon at all. And as scholars have noted, the first social labels appeared in the late 19th century when the National Consumers League issued a so-called white labels for women's white cotton underwear that met certain social and labor standards. Um, that ended in 1918, not to compete with American um, unions, but unions eventually developed their own social label as well. And so now, you know, social label, we see, fast forward to current day, basically social labels work by incentivizing lead firms to uh, comply with a given set of standards in return for a certification that will presumably provide some kind of competitive advantage in the marketplace. So examples of social labels include fair trade initiatives, uh, such as the Fair Trade, uh, fair trade International, um, which is European based and certifies a lot of food items and Fair Trade USA. Um, and what makes some kinds of social labels particularly interesting for our purposes is their aim to forge a bond with the workers and people in the supply chain, certainly when on the, on the social criteria. Indeed, one of the hallmarks of fair trade organizations is their efforts to try to personalize those consumer-producer relationships. If you look at the websites of any one of these organizations, just try to do a quick screenshot, but basically what they're doing in these bananas and cocoa and all kinds of other food items is they're trying to make real the person who's on the other end of the supply chain and try to us to feel some kind of empathy at, um, to some degree. That's part of what they do. Um, you'll often see links to photos and long descriptions of the producers. Uh, often farmers um, are, are those producers since food and agriculture is the main industry. Um, and one are arena in which a social imaginary is particularly mobilized is in the growing niche market for high-end coffee. Um, and you'll see is another photo from Fire Trade International. You can, the, the caption is cultivating coffee and community in Las um, Capuzas. I don't know if you pronounce it that way. But, um, and basically, the... Um, so here, the dominant approach has basically been the FLO certification, where consumers are assured that the coffee and teas are sourced from teas and plantations that meet a minimal set of criteria. Um, another approach by some, which has been interesting, interesting to me, another approach by some boutique coffee companies that are not fair trade certified has been to describe their sourcing process as direct trade. So in this model, they don't do the, the, the labeling thing. They're not even certifying. They're basically saying, we're getting rid of all the intermediate marketers, all the, all the middlemen, and we're going to have a direct relationship with the producers. And this, I think, is another indication of something that's appealing to at least certain consumers who are willing to pay a premium in this, in this sense, where you're creating an illusion where basically your proxy, like these guys here, right, 
are going down and creating a direct relationship with these guys here. And you somehow, um, they are your um, representatives. And so you yourself, as the consumer of coffee, have a direct relationship with the farmers, which is part of the fantasy and the appeal. So this somewhat conceptual conversation brings me to uh, the final question, which is how might public law catalyze and make use of the consumer imaginary to aid consumers in being citizen consumers? And I think there are at least two ways, at least with an American law, that we can think about that. The first is through trade law. Um, social and labor concerns have long been incorporated into US as well as European trade policy. And perhaps the earliest example um, or bans by the US and other countries on the importation of goods made by forced and prison labor. Um, efforts to ban products made of child labor and labor conditionality um, in free trade agreements concluded with other countries. Those were the initial ones. Currently, these agreements primarily provide that trading partner countries must abide by international labor standards and domestic labor laws. And I would suggest that labor and trade provisions should be changed to facilitate triggering the consumer imaginary. So for example, they could require mechanisms of testimony and direct communications from supply chain workers that consumers could have access to. Lead firms could be required to post a testimony on their websites, or a governmental agency related to the trade agreements could do so and ensure its circulation. And these kinds of mechanisms and trade agreements would shift the current focus on state action. That's basically what all these trade and labor provisions do. They focus on what the other states are doing, largely through public law and enforcement, um, and shift it to try and mobilize the consumer imaginary to take action within the market to compel lead firms that are benefiting from these trade agreements. A second legal arena that's right for triggering the consumer imaginary um, are transparency and disclosure laws. So in the US, <clears throat> there's the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act, which provides that public companies that purchase certain minerals from the Great Lakes region of Africa have to file reports that describe their due diligence efforts at determining if the minerals are conflict free. And a second major initiative is in California, although US Congress has consistently tried to introduce a federal version that's never gone anywhere. And the California Transparency and Supply Chains Act basically covers retailers or firms that do business in California that have uh, gross receipts of more than $100 million. And each firm is required to report, quote, its efforts to eradicate slavery and human trafficking from its supply chain for tangible goods offered for sale. And the reports have to disclose, at a minimum, various aspects of the processes by which the company monitors its supply chain and implements processes to ensure that the supply chain is compliant um, and has to demonstrate how the companies are, in fact, engaging in due diligence, the magic terms. But the problem with these laws, these transparency laws, is that they only require rather technical reports from companies that are not really digestible or easily actionable by consumers. I mean, who's really going to read through these things? And what, what did they even say? Um, and so if what motivates consumers to boycott, by the way, I should just be clear, boycotting is a term that means rather than boycotting, where we're familiar with that, where you just say, I'm not going to purchase from this company, boycotting is when you actively do purchase from a company that demonstrates that its products are made in conditions to your satisfaction. So that's the term, boycotting. Um, I didn't make it up. And if, so if what motivates consumers to boycott and boycott is the imagined connection to producers, then fairly technical reporting on those internal sourcing processes are not going to likely motivate consumers um, to take action or discern between high due diligence or low due diligence activities, right? Because that's what the standard is for the companies, whether they're engaging in adequate due diligence. So some scholars, um, such as in a really strong empirical paper, for those of you who are interested in pursuing it, by Chilton and Sarfati, have suggested that we alter that law, the California Trans Transparency Law, so that consumers be provided with information about products at the checkout counter, and they, which would enable them to make purchasing decisions in a, in a more informed way. And I would suggest we even go a step further and think not simply about ratings or labels, which is basically what this is, um, what they're suggesting, um, which are, I think, relatively cold and impersonal, 
But instead, we should think about triggering, triggering the powerful consumer imaginary, which is not done through cold data and dry reporting, but rather we have to create psychic and imagined linkages between the consumers, the suppliers, other consumers, and of course, the workers. And it's a means of transforming the cold impersonality of the supply chain economy and market into one that is more human. And this would entail forms of direct communication from the workers themselves, as described in the work of Piggers and Rokenbach, that was described earlier. It might include, for example, worker testimonies that have been provided by NGOs and transnational labor activist networks that work in the field. And to ensure fairness to companies, which would certainly be a concern from industry, the NGOs could go through a governmental certification process themselves that would require them to meet certain accreditation standards and that would require them to comply with their own uh, due diligence standards. So to conclude, what I've sketched out here um, over the last 35, 40 minutes or so is really a starting point for a conversation. But what I've tried to argue is that if we are to effectively regulate labor and human rights in global supply chains, traditional legal tools are insufficient. Instead, citizen consumers and their activity in the market must be part of the solution. And by mobilizing and activating those consumers in their private role as consumers, the law can convert and harness that consumer drive into public policy goods. So I'll end there. So, so. Well, I think the phenomenon of sympathies with workers across the globe has been going on, obviously, for a long time. I don't know Lynn Hunt's work around this, so I'd love to take a look at it. It sounds very familiar to Anderson's work on imagined communities and those technologies of communication and information dissemination, which created these imagined links. I mean, in other work, you know, I've done a fair amount of work on India, and I thought one of the interesting uh, phenomenons that happened in the late 1800s is that a lot of Indian industrial law was generated because of pressure from basically concerned, concerned uh, housewives in Britain who were very concerned about the conditions of women workers and child workers in India. And so that was one of the early instances of um, pressure to, to improve things in the supply chain. We wouldn't, they wouldn't have put it in, at all in those terms, obviously, back then. But I'd, yeah, I'd love to take a look at that and see what she has done. Thanks. I'm, I'm letting Kevin call on people, so whatever, yeah.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. So um, a couple things. So one part of this equation, which I didn't really discuss, is that a lot of my work actually focuses on how do you develop the regulatory capacity of states in which these factories actually exist, for example, or the producers exist. That's much more interesting to me to basically build up democratic institutions for self-governance. And these tools, uh, it's, you know, I've worked a lot on trade and labor issues. I've always wanted trade agreements to be a mechanism fundamentally of doing that. Um, and so that's part of, that's one side that I don't really discuss around this, but that's where all of this is actually oriented towards. Um, and I don't want to make it seem like that I'm a huge fan of voluntary action and that this should all be put down to the consumer. I'm not, and part of where I think I'm trying to make a contribution is in we sort of see two worlds. We have the, the way that we've seen trade and labor agreements, which is slam partner trading countries on their uh, laws and their enforcement. Then we have what people love in the business school, which is CSR and voluntary action, which I think is highly limited and, and, and problematic. And I'm trying to think of how can we use public institutions in a designed way that take into considerations like that to trigger some kind of market action that will put pressure on lead firms, and then those lead firms will be directed and nudged in certain ways by our public institutions and laws to take actions that are compliant with those concerns that we're exactly talking about. Building up de democratic institutions in, in other countries, empowering people. Um, so that's, you know, that gets into a lot of Governance literature, which is, you know, if you've been, if you're familiar with governance um, approaches to regulation, it's those different levels that are interacting, and how do you kind of set goals so that private actors in society will reach those goals that are set by public institutions? I mean, it's beyond the scope of what we're doing here, but you're exactly hitting something that I didn't discuss really at all here, and that's for a larger question. And for the representation stuff, yeah, that's, that's important. You don't want to be, it, I don't know how to answer that. You're right, and I don't know, you don't want to create a situation like look at all the poor workers. I think there's ways, I think the good organizations don't do it like that at all. I think the real transnational labor activist networks work closely with unions and groups of activist workers um, who are actually taking charge and doing things. And so I think that you create solidarity rather than sympathy. So like letting workers drive their own. Yeah, and I, and, I, and I think that I've seen that done really well. Um, I think the CSR model is a philanthropy model and that I find highly bothersome to me. So I'm with you. I don't have a great answer for it, though, necessarily. So just one quick statement. Mm -hmm. I wonder Yeah, yeah. But what do you what can you define moral division of labor? Like, what do you mean by that? Oh, so like if there is a like um, uh, a, a problem that we, I guess, jointly maybe share a moral obligation to respond to. Mm -hmm. So one way to do it is say, well, there's there's one there's like one way we can do it, and we all have to do it together, and maybe that's the sort of public law model. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks.
Yeah, it would be a great natural experiment to have seen in the Accord. In the, those, there, so one was called the Accord and one was the Alliance, these two projects in Bangladesh that came out of Rana Plaza. It'd be interesting to see if similarly situated companies that decided to join those initiatives um, perform better than any companies that stayed out. The problem is almost no company stayed out. So it's probably hard to measure, and I'm not an empiricist. So, um, and this is sort of like the first stage of this, and I'm, I'd like to see more and more of the empirical research on that. So the, the answer largely is I don't know. Um, and, but again, it's probably, it's so bifurcated, like if you look at Walmart, Walmart's not going to be that relevant in part because if Walmart's largely occupying like from that experiment I described, the $18 and the $12, even lower. Walmart consumers are really all about price. But it would be interesting to go in Walmart and put a sign over something, which it would never happen, saying, this t-shirt was made with forced labor, but you get it's 20 cents less than this other t-shirt. What would happen? My intuition is even the Walmart shopper, if told that, would go for the 20 cent more t-shirt. Mo not everyone, but a lot. Great. Okay. Great. So there's a lot, a lot there. So first, the question of citizenship, of course, is a huge one. And in the in the larger paper, I actually get in a fair amount on the political theory on evolving notions of citizenship. Um, so yes, typically, traditionally, citizenship has been bounded by the nation state of a um, to create a political community. Um, but cosmopolitan theorists. Cosmopolitans basically believe that that's inadequate to really address the global economic and social problems that have arisen in the new economic form. So they make an argument that we need to conceptualize a citizenship in a, you know, more broadly. Now, how we actually get ourselves to do that is another question, but I do think that part of what I'm suggesting is a step towards that, because we can't address the problems that I was talking about today of work, of labor violations, environmental degradation in supply chains because we have lead firms now that are 
generating economic activity, yet the country in which the lead firm is located does not have the jurisdictional authority to regulate the, the problems, in, in the case of environment, the externalities, that are being created by that economic activity. And we can't rely often on the countries in which the suppliers are located to do so. So how do we address this issue? Um, there needs to be a larger conception of citizenship so that we see that the actions that we take through the market and society um, are having impacts around the world and on ourselves, and that our typical means of political activity, political engagement, are not sufficient to address it. So how do we, you know, short of having a global parliament, which we're not going to be able to do anytime soon and may not even be desirable, are there some kind of intermediate forms of um, institutions that can, from a consumer, from a uh, cosmopolitan perspective, address some of these problems? Now, that's a way bigger question than I can answer. So, I think on an intermediate level, if we break it down to these micro, which aren't so micro problems that we're looking at here, there are some things that we can do. And I do think that what I'm trying to suggest is that. If, we, if you accept my intuition, which is that consumers, when confronted with stories, images, connections, will create empathy and forms of connection to people around the world, that is a form of cosmopolitanism. And they want to take actions that will make things better that will make things more equal because part of our notion like Anderson what we have to have as part of a political community is to imagine that there's this horizontal equality between us even when there's not so I think that what I'm suggesting is that creating some kinds of tools to help catalyze that and that seems a little abstract but that's kind of what I'm, I'm trying to get at here and I'm not taking a strong stance for cosmopolitanism versus a more traditional founded community approach to citizenship. Um, I'm sympathetic to the bounded, but I don't think, but I I'm also think it's important to have a broader view. And I think that we're now, because of the, the way that our economy has been, has developed, that we have to have a broader view to address the larger problems. Oh, did you want, I didn't address the other stuff, but if you want, we can, we're running short on time, I imagine. You want me to, okay, go ahead. The trade agreements is also a big, a big issue because um, my big critique of trade agreements for a long time has been that they're just uniquely focusing on state action and state sanctions. And that's um, all they do. When in fact, if you really want to be able to address the, address the problems that um, like within the course of labor provisions we're trying to address, you have to get deeper into society and change behaviors and create different kinds of incentives among private actors. And trade agreements have not been doing that, except in a sort of somewhat unique example that I keep coming back to, which is a trade agreement between the United States and Cambodia back from 1999 that created an institution that uh, monitored factories and created all kinds of incentives. I'm not going to get into all of that. But I do think there is a role, not necessarily for trade agreements saying you must have these social labels, but for trade negotiators. Um, to think creatively about institutions modeled somewhat like this, what the, the, institute, the organization now better work. If you guys are interested in learning more about it, you can learn more about it. ILO, World Bank Project, to basically improve working conditions and supply chains. Better work is either, ex, as it was explicitly, a version of it was made explicitly required in the Cambodia-US agreement. And the United States Congress has basically implicitly required that it exist as a condition, not in the text itself, but implicitly required that um, it exist for various kinds of trade laws and trade agreements to be uh, passed in the United States. So they had a, those better work programs had to exist in the partner countries. I think there's just a lot more room to be creative. And that, that's my main, main point. So I'll leave.
No, I know exactly what you mean. So, yeah. It's obviously a, that's a complicated question. The, if the, the Micheletti and Stoll book from 2013 breaks down a lot of that data, but it's all basically, it was Europe and the United States. So we don't uh, necessarily, I, I don't, I couldn't claim, there, I'm sure there's some research out there about developing countries, and I'd love to take a look, and I plan to keep on the stream, so I'll hopefully find some of this out. But um, obviously in social democracies, there's more of a focus, so Sweden, 60% engage in boycotting or boycotting or both. U.S. is one of the lower, but it's still, people claim 28% engaged in it somehow. Now my intuition with developing countries is that it's a slightly different question. We, we now live in a completely outsourced economy. So we have no engagement or exposure to anyone, on, or not anyone, but very few people that, you know, far fewer than we used to. We buy stuff on Amazon, so there goes the retailer. The person who makes our jeans, they're not around anymore. Um, in developing countries, I'm not sure the economies have become quite so disaggregated to the same level. Um, and obviously, there's a relationship between affluence and ability to pay and, and these things, if there is a cost to um, making conscious, you know, conscious consumer decisions. But yeah, it's a great question, and I'd like to see what those drivers are. One thing I will say, though, is that a lot of companies, like I said, I've done you know, work in India. It's very interesting, it's a very different model, but in India, a lot of the major conglomerates, because they are dominated, India is dominated by some very big conglomerates, take what they call corporate social responsibility very seriously. Now, what drives that is complicated. I'm not sure it's the consumer so much as maybe a general sense of, uh, you know, India is a complicated society, it's class-based, it's caste-based, a sense of taking care of those beneath you. I don't know, it's complicated. But there is, CSR is a thing in a lot of developing countries, but in different contexts. Yeah, that's a great question. stick pictures in front of them of yeah. the effects of what they're doing. <laughs> I have a question. I, I know we've discussed that the more farmers and solely industry but what about companies that have to be that Well, I'm going to disagree with you about Apple. I think Apple is very responsive and sensitive to these issues because when it, when there are about 13 or so workers, I don't know the exact numbers, committed suicide in a factory in China, Apple did take it seriously. And Apple, though, is the model that may be the least um, extendable because it is so contingent. What is Apple? It's basically this symbol, right? So if that symbol starts getting tainted, by dying workers, it's going to be in trouble because it's an affluent consumer base that purchases computers. And Apple's been, it has cash, it's been very responsive, it actually does a lot in its supply chain. Yeah, but wouldn't that still come after the fact? It wasn't, they didn't sort of manage it well from the beginning. They kind of cleaned up the picture. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying they're good or bad. Like, I don't like these moral judgments. I think every company is responsive to markets. And so, they were responsive. Maybe it was after the fact. Yeah, I, we can't rely on companies being good because they're nice people. That is not my thing at all. And I think that's a major fallacy in business schools. So let's take another, let's, how about another example? Because I actually, I, the reason I don't think Apple's a great example because in reality, compared to lots of other electronics manufacturers, they really do take action and are engaged. I mean, I still show films in my classes of like a BBC expose of, of conditions in, in factories in, um, in China. So I do think there's, there's problems, but they are, 
I feel fairly secure in saying way better than a lot of other electronics companies who don't who aren't so image and brand sensitive. Um, so, but the it's a totally relevant question, right? And uh, my my point is that if we were buying an Apple computer, say you went into the Apple store and hanging over the computer or the iPhone was some kind of picture of workers that was certified by, and some literature certified by an NGO that they were forced to put there about what's going on in the factory and maybe some color coding system. I mean, of course, this is a pie in the sky fantasy at this point. But the point is that I think you would be affected. You would maybe go in there, you'd look around, you might have some social stigma, particularly because of the other people who are shopping there. And look how things fast things turned. I mean, look at Uber. Uber suffered, it really did actually materially suffer from its bad reputation and from its jerky CEO. So I do think consumers do make a difference, at least in, in certain niche areas. So I'm just going to, I'll just push back a little bit from there. Okay. So you're suggesting maybe um, specific um, legal remedies should be available through private litigation. Right, information generation for, at some level, the, the market. Right. Yeah. And that's a lot of what Uber has been, has been discovery processes that have allowed Uber to be embarrassed. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, if you left the house, class arbitration camp, yeah. they give you incredibly difficult to actually win an arbitral award against them. You don't necessarily have to get that far. Mm -hmm. So we can't lose sight of that side of it. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's great. Thanks again. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.